A young writer named Yuji Hori is riding high off placing in a programming contest hosted by Enix, a tabloid magazine turned video game software company with his game Love Match Tennis. He's so happy about this, he decides his freelancing work for Weekly Shonen Jump isn't enough to satiate his creativity and becomes a video game designer. All by himself, he creates the Portopia Serial Murder Case. Now, Portopia isn't too important. It only inspired several video game legends, almost sold a million copies in an era where game audiences were smaller and redefined what a visual novel was and remains the legendary foundation set for visual novels today. But you know, <laughs> no biggie. Hori isn't satisfied with his latest hit. After a few more visual novels under his belt, he wants to create a different experience. He's inspired by his favorite computer RPGs and wants to dabble in a little fantasy. He assembles a team. You know how this goes. With the help of his manager at Shonen Jump, Hori asks Akira Toriyama to do the art and character designs for this new fantasy RPG idea. Toriyama, already a successful mangaka after creating the popular Dr. Slump and afterwards Dragon Ball series, signs up for the project. Then, and retroactively, unfortunately, a passionate fan letter from esteemed composer Koichi Sugiyama, complimenting Enix on their shogi video game, inspires the company to hire him to compose for them. He says yes. This eventually leads to the now dead and while alive known Holocaust denier and homophobe Koichi Sugiyama to compose for the legendary RPG that started it all, Dragon Quest. Thus, the legend of Dragon Quest's Big Three was born. But legends have a funny way of forgetting people. It isn't often talked about, so what you might not know is there was a fourth. And maybe a fifth, but definitely a fourth. Another person we owe Dragon Quest to, and one who deserves more recognition for their efforts. Around the same time Yuji Horii was submitting his video games to Enix's competitions, another young man was doing the same. His name is Koichi Nakamura, and his game Door Door is runner-up in the first Enix submission contest. He ports Door Door to various platforms, earns a ton of royalties off of doing so, and while attending university, opens Chunsoft, a company you've no doubt heard of. And if you haven't, well, you've probably heard of some of their games. It was Nakamura who helped Yuji Horii port the Portopia serial murder case to the Famicom, which led to its popularity and success in Japan. Nakamura himself had proven to be a capable self-starter, founding a company at the age of 19 and managing to keep it afloat. It was Nakamura who shared with Horii a love for computer RPGs, and together they came up with the idea of creating a fantasy RPG for the Famicom. Why bother mentioning Nakamura? Well, his noticeable absence from recognition is a great microcosm of the way Dragon Quest is perceived. Legends tend to exaggerate the truth, to make rags to riches out of its heroes and conjure the tales of unsuspected success out of thin air. The legend of Dragon Quest hasn't only eclipsed some of its heroes, it's also a bit of revisionist history. It's convenient to pin much of the RPG genre's beginnings on Dragon Quest, to worship it as this great ancestor. And humbly, we should. But not for the reasons you think. I bring all this up because noticeably, Dragon Quest wasn't made by complete novices. Every single hand in its production had come from prior success or relative fame. This wasn't a production of amateurs or underdogs. This isn't a story about success in the face of failure. It's about strengths, about people focusing on what they do best, collaborating and trusting the others with parts of the project they don't have the expertise in. Dragon Quest is fascinating because it's a lesson in making what you already like even better, and people loved it. After a bit of convincing from Hori, who wrote articles in Shonen Jump talking about RPGs being cool around the time it was coming out, Dragon Quest sold a million copies in six months. A million copies nowadays is a great sales record for a game to have, but we're talking about 1980s video games in Japan here. A million copies is almost half the amount of people who owned a Famicom. That's one in three people with a Famicom also owning Dragon Quest. Utterly bonkers. Formative for an interactive media still in its fledgling years. 
People will tell you its 2D art style became a staple for RPGs, but, but elements like this existed well before Dragon Quest. Their limitations everyone shared. What we owe to Dragon Quest is above these superficial factoids. Dragon Quest proved RPGs could sell well, a point Hironobu Sakaguchi made when he fought for approval to make Final Fantasy. It was a reaction to Dragon Quest that inspired the origins of Earthbound. Without Dragon Quest, you don't get Final Fantasy. You don't get the long-running RPG series you've come to love. And so Dragon Quest took Japan by storm, releasing more mainline series entries in the years to come, entire spin-off lines, enough merchandise to Scrooge McDuck dive headfirst into, and even opening Dragon Quest themed cafes. Yuji Horii was propelled into celebrity status. He was called on to do interviews and became a prominent figure in the games industry. Chunsoft snagged a sweet deal too. Koichi Nakamura's company went on to develop the next four Dragon Quest titles and along with Hori became household names. But why isn't Dragon Quest as popular or appreciated in the West? It wasn't like the first Dragon Quest didn't sell well out here. 500,000 copies sold isn't a number to sniff at, especially for a series being released onto a console approaching its twilight years. To be fair, I couldn't really corroborate that number. Digging deeper led me through four different fan sites and ended in a dead web page. But we can generally agree it sold well enough to maintain its popularity. This doesn't even include its association with Nintendo products. Dragon Quest got a big popularity shove thanks to Nintendo Power Magazine, of all things. At one point, they were giving copies of the first Dragon Quest away to anyone who subscribed to Nintendo Power. This didn't just put Dragon Quest in the hands of gamers, it was also extremely lucrative for the magazine, and a better deal than going out and buying the game separately. By the end of the promotion, Nintendo Power had half a million new subscriptions, and Dragon Quest had half a million new players. So what gives? Someone might say RPGs didn't do well in the West at the time, but I have a hard time believing this. We had tabletop and computer RPGs in spades. I've tried doing the research on this more than once before, and people will give you a hundred different reasons why, but it mostly comes down to bad timing. North America's release of Dragon Quest was right at the end of the NES's prime time. It came out over here in 1989, and the SNES was already being shown off at press conferences alongside the promise of a brand new Dragon Quest game for it. Dragon Quest V, to be exact. If you were someone in the know, you'd already be a little let down knowing you were four titles behind the latest. With such a huge gap between regional releases, potential fans might have decided to wait for an updated release that never came. The SNES rolled out in 1991, but Dragon Quest IV wouldn't come out on the NES until 1992. That's a huge mismatch, made more sour knowing the SNES versions of Dragon Quest, whether they were new entries or remakes, never made it to the West either, and were better versions with quality of life changes. And honestly, I think that was kind of it. Poor release windows for increasingly outdated titles compared to their sequels, coming to an audience getting ready for an entirely different era of video games. I think this contributed to Western audiences misunderstanding what was so important about Dragon Quest. The truth is, Dragon Quest wasn't the first video game RPG out there, and much of what we credit Dragon Quest for is thanks to its inspirations. We've misunderstood its impact on the genre, but it did still make an impact. A big one, it's Dragon Quest's living legacy. Yuji Horii and his team weren't crafting brand new concepts never before seen in video games at the time. They were taking their favorite kind of games and simplifying them into a distilled, accessible form while incorporating systems and features to achieve this goal. They were adapting the RPG concept into a more user-friendly experience. Okay kids, so back in the day, when we wanted to play an RPG, we were subject to the whims of the command line. The command line was where we had to type in keywords the game would recognize and allow us to do certain actions. So if you wanted to open a door, you'd have to type open door into the command line to do it. If you wanted to move in a certain direction, you'd write east or west, and you'd have to do this every time you wanted to move. But sometimes, the command line was looking for a specific set of words, and your particular vocabulary choices were effectively the same thing 
but not literally the same thing. And when they didn't literally match up, you'd get an error message instead of progress. To avoid this in Dragon Quest, Yuji Horii utilized a tool he had come up with for Portopia sequel, and I'm sorry, I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation, Hokkaido Rensa Satsujin, Ohotsukuni Kiyu. It was the selection or command menu. The command menu would let you pick a specific range of actions, making it easier to predict player inputs and eliminating user syntax error from preventing progress. Players knew with certainty their commands weren't working because it wasn't a valid action and didn't need to worry about having missed out on progress due to a difference in grammar between them and the programmer. You could play with full confidence knowing you had every command at your disposal and spend more time puzzle solving and less on troubleshooting. More importantly, playing an in-depth RPG on a console was now reasonably feasible. A system with limited input options and even greater hardware constraints than the already claustrophobic Apple IIs of the time could be navigated without painstakingly typing out commands on a controller. Hori had used the command menu for Portopia's Famicom release, presumably with Nakamura's help, and its success on the console helped solidify the command menu's value as a feature. But Dragon Quest's command menu proved RPGs could be simplified without removing what made them entertaining. It asserted the senses of exploration and discovery commonly found in RPGs of the time could still be felt after demystifying what a player could or couldn't do. The inclusion of a command menu was inspired by Hori's own gaming antics. An interview from 1987 in Beep magazine reveals his struggle to complete adventure games and his worries about players forcing their way through Dragon Quest. I've played a lot of adventure games myself, but the truth is I never cleared a single one. There'd be some item in the game right in front of me and I'd try to pick it up, but the computer would respond with, I don't understand that, or why don't you try something else? I just end up frustrated. What the hell? That was my number one problem with text entry based games, and why I adopted the command based system. But I had my worries about the command system too. I realized if a player just went through and selected every command option, he'd eventually solve any puzzle in the game just by brute force. If things are too easy to solve, a player won't get emotionally involved with the game. This interview is a veritable goldmine for anyone curious about Hori's tastes and design philosophies. And for anyone who knows the reputation the original Dragon Quest has, it's a jaw-dropping collection of items. Because it goes against almost every dissenting opinion about Dragon Quest out there. In my original Dragon Quest video, I made a joke about how hard it was to make progress and implied it was like this to sell you the strategy guide. But Hori contests this concept outright. I don't think it's a proper game if you need to use a strategy guide or something to solve puzzles. If you solve puzzles like that, you aren't really playing a game. It'd be more correct to say you're just following someone else's playthrough. He follows this up by saying, In my opinion, if the player doesn't know what to do in a game or where to go, I think it's boring. That was something I paid special attention to when we made Dragon Quest. Then, when asked about the decline of adventure games and why it's happening, he responds, People think adventure games are boring when they're stuck and don't know what to do. On that point, RPGs allow you to level up at any time. So if you get stuck, you can just do something else for the time being. And he's making an amazing point here. You can't really get stuck in Dragon Quest. Its gameplay loop won't let you. Part 1. Talk to everyone you see. Make notes of important information they give you. Part 2. Listen to this information and go to the locations described. Part 3. Fight monsters along the way and try not to die. Unlike adventure games of the time, getting stuck in Dragon Quest meant fighting more monsters while you searched the world map for what you needed or revisited towns to reread NPC dialogue you might have misunderstood. And yeah, it sounds boring and repetitive to you and I in the current day, but these were the puzzles to solve. And this wasn't really a thing RPGs were doing at the time. Hori's adventure game background compelled him to make adventure game styled progression on top of a monster fighting RPG, not the other way around. The RPG elements of Dragon Quest, unlike its progenitors, were in service to the game's narrative structure. 
you were going to fight a giant golem. Not because you were playing an RPG and fighting golems in RPGs is what you did, but because the story Hori had written dictated there'd be a fight with a giant golem. In older RPGs like Ultima, you don't have standout fights against specific monsters like this. There aren't boss monsters per se, and there was no natural progression from one town to the next, if there even were towns. You just kind of did stuff in no particular order. In Wizardry, another of Dragon Quest's ancestors, you run straight into a dungeon to fight monsters and just kind of dungeon crawl, I guess. Nobody really needed a reason to do any of it, it was just fun to mess around in those systems. But Dragon Quest has a linear path. Dragon Quest has episodic beats and utilized RPG combat mechanics to create an explicit narrative. These are the towns you're going to visit in roughly this order. These are the dungeons you'll find on your adventure, and these are the specific monsters you'll have to fight to make progress. And you find key items along the way because you paid attention to the narrative clues, not necessarily because you beat the monster guarding it. A lot of people credit Dragon Quest for having the first examples of nonlinear gameplay, but that's just not true. It should be better known for being one of the first RPGs with basic storytelling structure. Its non-linear elements are only as obvious and noteworthy as they are because Dragon Quest isn't a non-linear experience. Because its hint system relied on talking to NPCs for information, previously required steps in the player's quest would turn into optional tasks they could avoid altogether. Defeating the giant golem in front of Cantlin is necessary to learn where on the overworld map a key item is hiding. Rescuing the Princess of Tantagel from the Mighty Dragon will reward you with the Princess's Pledge, an item which will tell you what position on the world map you're currently on. But it's possible to skip both of these encounters if you already know where to find this key item, or if you happen to stumble upon it through sheer luck in modern iterations of the game. Dragon Quest even sported a totally optional dungeon with bonus equipment to find. These are the non-linear gameplay segments people tend to be referencing when they talk about Dragon Quest, but the nomenclature is all wrong. It can't be optional if you need to know about it beforehand to skip it. Optional means unnecessary, but most of these are definitely necessary. Unless you've played Dragon Quest before. See, Dragon Quest isn't the first video game RPG to introduce non-linear gameplay, but I'd argue it is the first video game RPG to introduce New Game Plus changes. By sequence breaking Dragon Quest with prior knowledge, you effectively are on a New Game Plus run. On subsequent playthroughs, players in the know can avoid boss battles and even get a different ending for not saving the princess. And speaking of firsts, it's amazing how much of Dragon Quest's iconic elements and imagery is rooted in its first appearance. Toriyama's monster designs are timeless, but they were far from what people expected out of fantasy settings. Slimes with goofy smiles, dragons with big grins and ghosts playfully sticking their tongues out. Big round eyes and bright color palettes made up the evil army destroying the world. Cute enemy designs running perpendicular to the story setting has been a long-standing identifier of the series and of Toriyama's influence on it. The monster designs of the first Dragon Quest slowly raise the stakes by escalating in size and color. What begins as a heartfelt adventure of bashing slimes and swatting ghosts becomes a harrowing brawl against scorpions, skeletons, possessed armor, and dragons. Even on repeated playthroughs, there's still a tiny spark of panic whenever a familiar enemy reappears under a new color scheme, indicating you've walked into a deadlier zone. Other Dragon Quests will adapt this sensation with much darker scenarios as early as Dragon Quest II, where Toriyama's adorable enemy designs massacre an entire kingdom. This aesthetic dichotomy is just as much a part of Dragon Quest as its mechanical staples. Enemies growing stronger as you cross bridges is the better known of Dragon Quest's balancing acts, but it wasn't the only one. Though they are more of a legacy inclusion nowadays, the poisonous floor tiles of Dragon Quest aren't only a detrimental annoyance, they're a stat check just as much as the enemies attacking you are. 
if you can't survive the poison, you probably aren't ready to venture into that cave. But those damaging tiles are also a striking color compared to the rest of the town or overworld you see them in, and they almost always have something or someone on the other side of them. If you can't survive the trek across, their clashing appearance would serve as a stark reminder to come back later. Because anything trying to keep you away in Dragon Quest is obviously hiding valuable progress or equipment behind it. This feeling still permeates in modern Dragon Quests. When veterans of the series see a poisonous swamp, they expect treasure is waiting just past it. With this in mind though, the first Dragon Quest might seem like it's predisposed to grinding. Grinding is definitely a method of conquering its in-game challenges, but I'd claim you aren't necessarily expected to do it. Designating monsters of scaling difficulty to separate continents helps funnel players towards areas of the world map they can survive in, but survival in Dragon Quest means slightly less than it does in its contemporaries. It doesn't have game over screens, at least not via player death. Restarting at Tantagil Castle whenever you die halves your gold, yes, but you retain all your experience. Instead of treading old level ups, you're consistently growing stronger with every failed attempt at a boss or dungeon crawl. The point made by Dragon Quest's designer being, failure is only a beginning. It might seem uninspired by today's metrics of side content and complex battle systems, but back in the day, this was peak design. It wasn't grinding. It was persevering against an obstacle, running at the enemy full force every encounter and slowly growing stronger with every boss rush attempted. There were play sessions devoted to trying to beat a specific boss over and over again, and times when those sessions ended without progress until finally, after getting back up, the monster was slain and your triumph yielded new events. Maybe a new location or a hint to the whereabouts of one of Dragon Quest's precious MacGuffins. Does this sound a bit far-fetched to you? Yeah, you might not be alone. Video game RPGs after Dragon Quest rarely, if ever, opted to do what it was doing with game overs. It's weird, isn't it? This huge legacy, this respect and adoration for a series which has inspired so many, yet so rarely do you see its more unique elements utilized in the genre it spearheaded into popularity. Or maybe it only seems that way because of how many other features in Dragon Quest have been constitutionalized into the genre and beyond. Maybe you're playing something right now inspired by Dragon Quest, or inspired by a game inspired by a game inspired by Dragon Quest. Maybe you're a fan and you don't even know it, or you were a fan long before you thought you were. Dragon Quest is timeless because of its focus on ease of play and redefining what exactly an RPG was. It didn't have to be fashioned after a D20 system. It didn't need to be as rough and rugged as Wizardry, and it didn't have to be as open booked as Ultima. They could be streamlined. They could look cute. They could be a lot more linear and they didn't need a thousand possible actions. We just needed to think a little outside of what we were used to seeing. And Dragon Quest organized these concepts in a unique way to create a coming of age story. Not the in-game coming of age story, that's there, but it's only significant because it reflects what Dragon Quest was representing at the time of its release. Here was a game without game overs. Here was an RPG focusing on visuals and story beats, with a cleaned up UI and an accessible control scheme. An RPG combining the best elements of several games, simplifying the experience for a wider audience to appreciate, and still delivering on the challenging experience RPG fans were looking for. Dragon Quest was the video game RPG's coming of age and it was the beginning of a beautiful adventure.